because uh, after we exposed this kitchen cellar in eight or nine months, found the two ovens, we found layers of fish bones, sturgeon bones that had been processed in the ovens. But above that, or then also we found that ceramics uh, of the same vessel would mend together from the well, from this pit, from that cellar, all around the entire uh, uh, fort side. Well, what's going on there? Well, when Delaware came in, he said he cleansed the town. We think it was a heck of a mess left there after all those people dying. So anyway, uh, and then there we also found more uh, butchered horses and dogs. But this one was the shot. You may have heard somewhere along the line, but uh, in a dark layer of garbage and trash, one of the, uh, uh, my assistants, Jamie came out and she said, hey, I think you better come down here and look at this. And so we're looking at an Indian pot and next to it some teeth that seem to be in, in, in place. And then it was clear that this was a mutilated human skull, pretty crushed. And nearby, we found a, a, a severed uh, leg bone of a human. It's not a bear. It's in there with butchered horses and dogs and those other things. So we turn to the, the nation's really most foremost uh, uh, forensic anthropologist, Dr. Douglas Adelson in Smithsonian. They've worked with us in all various areas. And he got looking at it. and he began to see certain things that you can determine. One is that the skull, after it was repaired, is that of, of, of a girl, it's a woman. Uh, and we began to call her Jane, and all of us would call her Jane. And it turned out that she uh, was about 14 and a half years old, you can tell by the teeth developing. The wisdom tooth is an alpha in the back, as you can see in that x-ray. So there's a 14, 15 year old girl, and she's, she's not an Indian because you, by studying stable isotopes and teeth, you can tell if someone was raised on corn or raised on wheat. And corn was an American product, so it was not an Indian, and it must be an English girl. Uh, and then other reasons to say from the south coast of England, and there's been a little bit of a biography book from this. But the shocking news was looking at the forensic uh, sort of cold case evidence. Uh, on, the, on the skull, and we noticed the, the cut marks in the front. Then, uh, with in the, at the Smithsonian, they found hundreds and hundreds of cut marks on the skull. And other, I won't get too graphic here, but uh, this woman, after she was dead, and that could be proven, uh, she underwent what he called processing. Now, I, as a historian, I had read several accounts of the fact that at the end of starting time, or near the end, a couple of people resorted to survival campaigns. And I never believed this. I thought it was an exaggeration. It was going to try to make the governor look bad or something. But George Percy, Gates was governor, John Smith, they all wrote about it. And I, but after seeing this, it's true. That did happen. They didn't survive by doing that. And it wasn't, again, widespread, but it did happen. And then going back to the slate, there was a story about a man who did murder his wife uh, and uh, claimed that he did it, uh, uh, he didn't murder her, but she had died and he was cannibalized. Well, he was executed for, for the murder. This is the only murder I, that's on record at Jamestown, which is interesting. Uh, so that could be, be depicted on the slate for some reason. Leave it there. So why, what, how, what caused the starving time? Well, in 1609, the company had the idea of sending along the straits you wound up in Bermuda and they had to get to Virginia from there. Um, they sent this fleet, three or 400 people, women, families, they're all coming in in 69 the summer and they got in a hurricane and the provisions all got spoiled. Well, so they arrived, here's 30, 300 starving people and they're already beginning to starve in, uh, uh, in Jamestown as well. And then uh, other evidence has been the uh, scientists have de determined uh, that there was a drought during the time, talk about bad luck, from 1606 to about 1613 in Virginia. So the Indians couldn't even supply them because they were, they were starving there. And yet, uh, they were uh, healthy enough uh, to surround the fort. Uh, they they uh, besieged it, so the colonists couldn't get out to hunt fish or any of that. They were, they were stuck in the fort. 
and they had to choose between dying in the floor or getting killed by going out. Uh, so um, that's the, the starving time. Now, just uh, as an aside here, before that, there was evidence of a lot of trade with the Powhatan, and they loved copper. This was their precious metal. And on the right is a, is a 1580s depiction of a Powhatan or a, a Algonquin Indian. Uh, with, you see that the pendant, we found pendants, we found coins, we found trade beads, uh, all in the form in these various layers. So it's things that were being used uh, by uh, the colonists to get along with the Indians and trade for food, but they couldn't find them. Although they did bring some food in, in, in some of the Indian pots. And in there, there were apparently women making beads, trade beads, out of um, uh, a, sh a shell. And the tools, they're using uh, stone tools. But it, remember, it's, it, the context is that it, these were being done when the English are there. So th there was one account that 40 to 50 of the colonists had married with the Indians throughout Virginia. Now, that's probably an exaggeration by the Spanish, but still, this was probably going on. And then we found this uh, trinket, I guess you might say. But we think it's the only depiction of power. We think it's Powhatan. It was a pendant for a necklace, uh, and the in that in that time there were emissaries that would go back and forth between the Indians and the colonists, and you had to have some way to prove who you are. Well, the Indians said you have to wear shell necklaces, and the English said, well, you have to wear 